Hello. How's hey, it Jacob. going? How's it? Good to see you. <laughs> Good to see you too. How are you? I'm great. How are you doing? I'm good. Just, you know, enjoying Michigan summer here in Detroit. Yeah. Nice. Um, we'll give it a couple of minutes. Usually, um, yeah, it takes people a couple to get in here, but. That's good. Cool. Sorry, hey. I should have. Hey, Neil, how's it going? Hey, Neil. Hey, uh, good. Just getting off the two hour Detroit Riverfront Conservancy meeting. Oh, wow. <laughs> Just coming right on over. Nice. How, how are things generally with the teams? Uh, pr pretty good. I think yesterday was Detroit Housing Commission. It was a pretty lively discussion. Today was a nice meeting too, in terms of, in terms of like learning about meetings and agendas and talking to clients and making plans. So it's kind of like a live fish, but uh, it's exciting. Nice. Glad to hear it's going well. Sorry, I should have asked Jose. We so we've been uploading. I'll show you so you can see the um, the video recordings onto our website here. Is that okay with you? If we if we do that? Yeah, absolutely. That's totally fine. Awesome. Thanks. We can get started. I think, yeah, people will join, but I want to be respectful of everybody's time. Um, so thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, super thrilled to welcome Jose Sanchez um, to our ongoing lecture series, where through the work of Taubman College faculty, we unpack terms ubiquitous in the field of public interest design, um, but that are often taken for granted um, or not really interrogated. Um, so this week, we've asked Jose to speak about his work through the lens of participation. Um, and for those who don't already know him and his work, um, he's an associate professor of architecture at Taubman. And he's the principal architect of his office, uh, Plethora Project, a game designer and a theorist. Um, he's a creator of video games, Blockhood and Commonhood. I think both are available on Steam. They're like real deal video games that are great. You should check them out uh, if you like video games or architecture uh, or urbanism. Um, uh, and he describes these as digital social platforms that aid the authoring of architectural and ecological thinking to non-expert non audiences. Um, and just recently in 2020, he published Architecture for the Commons, Participatory Systems in the Age of Platforms. Um, so if any, at any time anybody has questions, um, please, uh, of course, we'll have a Q&A at the end, but also if you want to enter them in the chat, um, we, can, we can get to them uh, at the end. Um, so Jose, thank you so much for coming and your time and your work, um, and I'll hand it over to you. Sure, thanks, Jacob. Uh, it, it's a pleasure to um, present the work uh, here and in, in this context as well. Let me share my screen and see if we're good to go on that oops sorry about that. you can see my screen right great so um i've called uh, this presentation um participation in the age of platforms which is the subtitle of of the book that i recently published uh, and yeah i would i would present a little bit about the book in case some of you might be interested, maybe digging deeper, but, but have a sense of what, what the book is about as well. Um, but I really wanna start with a, a bit of context. Um, I'm a Chilean architect. Um, I was born in Chile, I was raised in Chile. I spent all my, I did my, my, most of my education in Chile. And um, a lot of the things that are happening in Chile um, are certainly part of the kind of guide a little bit of, of, of the interest of, of what I'm doing in some degree. Uh, what is happening in Chile, if you're not aware, um, there has been an important social uh, transformation recently where there's been an, an interest to kind of change the constitution that was uh, set up uh, in the 80s. Um, I, I was born within the dictatorship of Augusto Pinochet um, and that at that time there was a constitution um, set up for Chile and that has been in place for 30 years. And uh, finally, there's been an, uh, an attempt to actually change the constitution of Chile. Um, and very recently, 
um, Lisa Lancon, who is a Mapuche linguist and an indigenous right activist, was elected as the, kind of, uh, the president of the Constitutional Committee. So there's, there's kind of a very profound transformation of what are the value systems, what are the kind of, um, what does it look to make a new 21st century constitution? Um, so a lot of that conversation, in a way, it's, it's very interesting to me. Um, especially when I moved to Detroit here, I think that I was uh, certainly overwhelmed uh, and I've always been kind of very interested on the work of, of Diego Rivera. Um, and if you go and see the murals uh, here in Detroit, uh, you can see that there's kind of a, a, a very powerful commitment to um, expose or kind of read and kind of work on the representation of certain conditions of labor and progress and uh, industry, right? Um, and it's not a coincidence, I think, that it, this is done obviously purposely in a mural form, in a form of, uh, at a scale that it can actually engage with audiences, that it could bring a different kind of audience into the work. Okay. You can hear me, right? Yeah, okay. So I was mentioning it's not a coincidence that uh, Chile has also uh, used public space. In particular, uh, this is a group called Por un Habitar Digno, like for a, for a just inhabitation, uh, who are kind of using public space to draw and, and represent some of the housing solutions that the Chilean government on, and, and some of the private sector has been offering, uh, really demonstrating how uh, precarious some of these conditions are. Um, so so the, the, the medium really starts bringing in the citizen. There is kind of a, a public engagement of the work and really uh, tries to establish a dialogue. Uh, which I think it's it, it's it's certain, certainly a, a, something that I'm, I'm I'm very interested in in terms of how can architecture open new channels, new uh, opportunities to kind of create a dialogue with with the public. So as I mentioned, um, I recently published this book, Architecture for the Commons. It's almost maybe a year now, uh, so it's maybe not so recent, but uh, it's still for me. This book has been. Uh, Kind of setting up an agenda that would be something that I'm, I'm currently working on, but I hopefully will continue to work on on years to come. Uh, and it really kind of I'm going to do a quick breakdown of some of the arguments in the book. Um, the book starts with a criticism towards certain traditions of architecture in terms of parametric thinking. I was a student of Patrick Schumacher in the Architectural Association, so I I, I kind of uh, learned a lot from from Patrick. But at the same time, I think that there's a kind of a fundamental critique that is necessary to be have uh, to the model of progress um, presented by that, by that system. At the same time, I look at the work of Buckminster Fuller and how Buckminster Fuller was coining this term ephemeralization, which basically means how can we do more with less and ultimately how can architectural systems become lighter and more uh, almost ephemeral, they start disappearing. And, and my critique is not a critique to the model, but it perhaps it's a kind of a, bringing him up that a, such a model has failed to, to provide the prosperity that Becky actually wanted it to achieve in the sense that it has really made um, a few people be able to do more with less and potentially create larger profits, but it hasn't really been distributing the wealth or the capacity of architecture to reach a larger audience, right? And one of the big challenges that we're facing today is that technologies such as 3D printing, this is a case of like a, a 3D printing of a, like an engine of a rocket, for instance, like metal printing. So very advanced forms of 3D printing uh, are aiding in what I call a coalescence of parts of kind of shrinking the number of components and elements that are necessary in design, right? And you could say, well, that's a really great thing. There's a lot of kind of uh, improvements in performance of, of objects, but that reduces the number of actors in the economy that have actually a say on, uh, on design, right? So you're actually reducing the number of actors in the economy, but you're through the process of what is called vertical integration, right? Companies start uh, basically monopolizing a, a supply chain. So what you can see here is um, what would otherwise be considered an assembly of parts or potentially welded parts, like 
contemporary techniques such as topological optimization. This is kind of a process that would kind of optimize the forces of a piece of geometry and ultimately 3D printing can really argue for this coalescence of parts, right? And you, what you can see as well in the case of large scale 3D printing is that the, this kind of old school model of the brick and the mortar, right? Uh, the brick being this kind of discrete parts that could be organized in different ways and the mortar being this malleable viscous material that could be uh, take form in many different uh, ways through the process of 3D printing. It has been the mortar, it has been a continuous model uh, that, that has kind of prevailed. And, and that kind of talks about a, a kind of a form of um, a monolithic or potentially aligns together with a form of vertical integration. Okay. So I read the work of uh, Zaha Hadid um, in this context, right? The, the fluidity of form as you can perceive it, it kind of goes very uh, technically to the differentiation of materiality um, and, and ultimately the coalescence of tectonics, right? Uh, in other areas and in other industries, we see a similar effect when, when you can see your iPhone, for instance, or, or your phone. iPhone actually introduced this specific kind of screw called the pentalobed screw, right? Which is a copyrighted screw that it's meant to keep you, the user, out of altering the, uh, the phone. So, uh, and, and recently has become quite a, an issue to, of discussion. There's a movement called the right to repair movement that really tries to argue for, we should have the argue to repair and to alter the devices we own, right? Uh, but under the contract of Apple, and by design in the tectonics in the details of Apple, you are meant to be kept out from any alteration. So one of these models is what I would call a closed topology. What we traditionally do in architecture is think of a, of a system of parts that all come together neatly into one jigsaw puzzle, right? But perhaps we ought to be thinking of a, an open topology, right? Like, a, as you know, with things like Lego, a, I do a defense for parts. And, you know, we're understanding the social consequences of losing parts as a, as a, as a discipline, right? If we start kind of benefiting a monolithic and kind of uh, forms uh, tectonics that coalesce parts into each other. And some of my own work, which I'm gonna discuss a little bit later, uh, really try to kind of celebrate parts uh, in their capacity to engage audiences, right? I'm gonna talk about this project in a minute later. And, but I also mentioned other cases. This is the work from Jill Redson, uh, who has been, um, um, together with myself and others, uh, as discussed in the book, arguing for this notion of the discrete, right? Which is, maybe it's a, it's a different way to argue for a certain form of modularity, but, but I, I, in the book I do kind of go into the nuance and the distinction between modularity and discreteness, right? But we can leave that for some other time. Uh, and again, some examples of how, when you start thinking of parts, you might start thinking of families of parts that seem to work with each other uh, and perhaps links between families, right? Like the work of uh, Golan Levin in the universal uh, construction kit, I, I find quite beautiful in the way in which he understands that there's already this kind of proprietary families of parts uh, that don't talk to each other. He kind of 3D prints and designs kind of links and connections between that. So uh, as an ideology, it suggests that perhaps we could have species of uh, incompatible parts, but perhaps there's also this opportunity to link them in different ways. Right? And then I, I transition in the book to discuss, uh, and what you'll see, it has also a very important influence in my own work. What is the, the layer, the informational layer? Right, that contributes to the organization of parts. Um, and here, what I call an immaterial architecture. So I'm really talking about software, I'm talking about uh, logical systems, uh, sometimes uh, games, um, but in the case of, uh, here of an example, uh, Jonah Friedman's Flat Rider uh, was already kind of a principle of how would you uh, invite users to have a, a certain uh, syntax for the organization of units and parts uh, in, in, a, in a larger structure, right? Um, and in the particular case of games, I think we've seen in other fields how, for instance, with the case of in the left, the, the game Folded, uh, which is a protein folding game, um, has invited users to kind of collaborate with scientists in, in, in discovering how protein should be folded in order to, to solve some scientific puzzles, right? Um, other games in, in, in urbanism, City Skyland is a game that 
have started to be like it's, it's far more accurate than things like SimCity. Certainly not a completely accurate model of reality in any way, but it certainly has been aiding um, to conceive and model neighborhoods. And I think there's a um, series of examples in, in Denmark that have been starting to use a city skylines as a, as a model for participation in the urban fabric. My own work in this, uh, in this area um, with video games such as Blockhood and Commonhood, which I'm going to discuss in a bit, um, add to kind of a, an attitude to, of architects that are trying to create an infrastructure for uh, participation. And what this infrastructure is, is basically software, websites, uh, open source code, uh, different forms that would facilitate the barrier of entry of um, you know, citizens with different uh, skill. I, I've been, in my bio, I talk about non-experts and I've been discussing the problem of non-experts quite a bit recently, but I think that we ought to be thinking like a whole um, gradient, right? Between a professional architect with different degrees of expertise and someone that is maybe a kid that is just starting to play a video game or perhaps kind of uh, get initiated in some concepts of architecture. Um, what is that gradient in between those two conditions, right? And I think that the, the dichotomy between expert, non-expert is, is not uh, good enough to capture the, the, the rich kind of participation that might occur uh, within an open source uh, attitude towards architecture. And finally, in the book, I try to argue that self-provision, right, the do-it-yourself movement, it's not just a completely alienating architects in a way. Um, communities and architects uh, together can perhaps create commons that are self-sustained. And I think that one of these examples um, that for me is deeply uh, close to my heart is the work uh, of Open City in Ritoque, which is a, a city uh, in Chile as well, uh, near Valparaiso in the coast, um, where there's a community of architects that are um, develop this cooperative, right? When there's kind of a, an engagement with a, a community but there's also a kind of a series of kind of value systems and codes that are kind of encoded in the architecture and in the poetry. And it kind of really transpires and connects the production of an environment together with culture, right? So uh, the practices architecture is kind of deeply entangled with the community. So I, I always try to present my work in, in the context of social combinatorics. And I will try to explain what that means through the lens of this first project called Bloom, right? As I mentioned, this is a project that I collaborated uh, with Elisa Anderson, who um, we were working together in London around 2012 for the London Olympics, where we developed this project. And this project is um, is basically uh, using the injection molding technique uh, to produce one singular piece of plastic. Uh, it's basically something like a, a Lego unit but it has very specific forms of connectivity um, and it can create through aggregation a uh, myriad of uh, different configurations, right? So it could be combined in a multiplicity of ways. Um, so we did not anticipate specifically what kind of uh, aggregations we wanted to obtain from the piece. Uh, we certainly run simulations to kind of understand what was possible, um, but we really wanted to kind of maintain kind of an open-ended approach towards its aggregation. Um, where, uh, as you can see here, there's a component of the project that is this bench that kind of gives a kind of a far more deterministic uh, beginning to the, to the project, but then the project really opens up and starts branching into, into the unknown in a way. And, and that unknown is, is, is a, also kind of produced by the fact that the piece is slightly flexible. So, so people realize quickly that they can start bending the rules quite literally, the rules of the game, and then really kind of taking it wherever they want. Right? And the fact that it's not just an installation that we produce and is set up to be uh, experienced, um, it really, it's been designed as a toy, as something that uh, it's to be engaged, right? So what you can see in the middle here, just behind maybe this, this woman we see in the middle of the picture is it's this kind of large plastic box where it's basically full of pieces um, for people to play with, right? And basically me, myself and, and, and other colleagues would be on site every day, really, you know, uh, documenting the kind of activity uh, we would have to kind of pack many times. 
what was going on throughout the day. But this took uh, place throughout the, the London Olympics in, in different sites. Um, and really um, every design, every kind of pattern, as I would call them, uh, or every recipe that people would put together would really um, be a token of participation, right? It would be a token of like, I was here, I, I was actually using it for this game or I was with a group of people trying to kind of create this little pavilion, right? And, and there was always a sense of learning from each other, groups kind of working with themselves, uh, but then maybe picking up what other people were doing, how did they figure out a way of like erecting a larger structure. Um, so the, the game became really educational and we, we took it into the classroom uh, in the UK um, to, to, to see how certain systems of logic are, uh, it, it becomes a very playful way of learning logic in a way. And that's, that's kind of the feedback that we were getting from that project. Um, moving to a, a different project using slightly a, a different idea. This is a much more recent, more recent project. It's a project called Foliage. Um, which was an independent research developed at USC where I was before coming here to Michigan. And I was admitted as a, as a proposal for the Tallinn Pavilion. So we, we got a third prize for the Tallinn Pavilion uh, proposal in year 2019, I believe. So we were looking at these Simpson strong ties, which are, it's a very inexpensive serialized form of connector, right? Um, that allows for the organization of, of wood, right? And then we designed our own connection um, aiming to uh, give certain purpose and certain orientation to, um, uh, to this kind of uh, two by twos um, that would basically be able to create a, a space frame, right? So as you can see here, this, this is some of the tests. This is a prototype that we did um, we never built the full project, but this was a kind of a, a, a first prototype of the project. And the idea behind this project is how do we design this kind of very uh, small component uh, that would add to kind of already an ecology of pieces that exist uh, as standardized uh, timber, right? Uh, and with a minimal intervention, we could actually start kind of creating uh, a space frame. So, for the competition, we suggested that we could do uh, certainly different configurations. And the final design of the pavilion was something that would be designed uh, as a series of workshops together with the community um, in Tallinn, in, in, for the biennial itself, right? And, and we presented a series of strategies to arrive to that form. Uh, one of them was actually, uh, again, gameplay, but in this case, doing it through the scope of a, of a physical game, right? So instead of actually sending to the biennial the, the final model of what we wanted the pavilion to, to do, we actually send this package of a, what the pavilion could be and the kind of engagement that we wanted to have with audiences in terms of like bringing people in, participating in, in understanding the logic of, of the architecture pavilion and understanding how systems of logic and structure emerge uh, to finally, you know, uh, arrive to a form. So uh, this included a series of 3D printed units emulating the kind of uh, the steel components that would be manufactured uh, at full scale and a series of instructions that would guide similarly to, again, Legos uh, have these instructables and, and IKEA manuals. How would you go about creating Kind of a base space frame. But then what was interesting to us is in that process of what are the possible variations, what are the possible uh, hacks that people might be able to do into the system, right? A, a second form of participation, you know, really thinking of how many different approaches could we have to um, engage uh, with, the, with the production of form in a public context was a video game. Um, and this is an image of Commonhood, a project that again, I'm gonna show in a few slides after. But um, it was the idea that we would have both a physical, like I think different people have different uh, approaches to a, or points of entry in a way to the work. So we didn't wanna anticipate that video games would be the only way into the game, but it would certainly uh, afford a more global and perhaps more scalable solution to participation while the physical would have a, a different kind of a sense or appreciation for the materiality and, and, and the tactility of the project. Right? So 
as I transition to, to start thinking of video games, um, a lot of the, the work that I do on, on games is um, influenced on, on a reflection upon contemporary platforms, right? So platforms, uh, for me, are, are a central uh, object of, of question and, and study. Um, we're talking about social media platforms uh, such as Facebook and YouTube. And in many ways, uh, there's been an important literature emerging about uh, the challenges of platform capitalism, right? how these platforms really become, yes, the playgrounds, but then in some, some, are, some would argue that the user is the product, right? But more importantly, I would say, uh, in the words of Shoshana Suboff, who's been writing kind of uh, quite important books, I would say, in regards to surveillance capitalism, is the idea that platforms are able to produce what she calls behavioral manipulation. They're able to persuade users and erode potentially democracy, as we saw in the case of Cambridge Analytica. Um, in in the in the elections uh, of 2016, right? So um, the idea is that uh, platforms have an incredible power, right? And we both ought to be designing them and thinking what are the the kind of the, the different challenges that we we face when uh, engaging with the design of platforms and when when are we kind of crossing certain ethical boundaries, right? And I think someone. Quite key here is Julian Assange, who has for years been arguing for the power of encryption and the power of privacy, um, the right to privacy of users, right? Uh, so how do you do those two things, right? Like you have a platform that is a great place for aggregating and kind of connecting people uh, and potentially creating lateral collaboration between, between users, but at the same time, the the hierarchical power of the platform suggests um, that we we need to be thinking of these networks in a way that they, that they protect the user, right? So when we start thinking of platforms in architecture, uh, you know, I think that we don't have too many of them, and and they're actually quite um, peripheral, I would say. To I mean, Instagram is certainly a a, a central platform used by architects a lot, but it, it's certainly not main uh, aimed for architecture. It really kind of celebrates the culture of the image. But we have things like 3D Warehouse, um, Hyper IO, which is starting to be a, an, an example of emerging platforms from Modelo IO. Some, some of them, I would say, are not really mainstream yet, but we're starting to see how uh, the notion of the platform has starting to infiltrate in the work of uh, the discipline, right? In other cases, projects that I admire uh, deeply. Um, like Wikihouse, the Wikihouse project is, is a great example uh, of a participatory open source or open source hardware initiative that uh, it's proposing a, a housing unit that is really uh, inviting to anybody that would contribute in a very open source fashion to improve and, and you can download all the blueprints online. Uh, a similar uh, research is performed by uh, Carolina Mota and Marcin Jevbowski. Um, they uh, were the founders of the Open Source Ecology Project and, and now they're working on the Open Building Institute. They also have these, this notion of the DIY as an open source platform where through GitHub, you would actually share uh, you know, the, the details and the tectonics of a building so that you would actually facilitate others to, to create their own DIY projects, right? Um, and in my view, like video games have been very well equipped over the years to uh, achieve this form of participation. When we, when we look at video games such as The Sims, for instance, um, they have amazing building tools or modeling tools for people to create content and, and design their own homes. You know, with the caveat certainly that uh, it's kind of proliferating a form of architecture or, com or perhaps commercial architecture that um, it, it serves the purpose of entertainment. Um, but, but I think that uh, there's perhaps a lot of room uh, to be made here if we start introducing kind of ecological values or, uh, or different kind of um, notions that are more aligned to, to what we discuss within, within the school, right? So um, I started doing uh, that. I started working on video games on 2013. Uh, and my first studio I, I run was in the Barlett School of Architecture. Uh, what is today, like was the first year of the BPro program. 
I proposed an agenda of starting to use uh, a software platform called Unity, which you can, uh, if you're interested in games, I would recommend to use to, to produce architectural um, prototypes that would start considering a player as, as an external form, as a, as a user that has this kind of unknown condition and, and would actually be able to play a game to produce their own architecture. And in this particular studio, there was an emphasis on energy harvesting. It was kind of a mechanic, if you want, of the game that you would have to kind of collect energy in some degree and convert and, and use that in, within the tectonics of the building. So as I moved to the US, um, I started developing my own video games, my own studio. I started developing video games as a, as a practice. And my first project was called Blockhood. Um, and, and there's a lot of material about this game uh, online. So I'm just gonna maybe skip some of the, the slides that I have here and, and the benefit of time and maybe opening more of a conversation. But, you know, Common Hood is, um, it's a, being the first video game I, I ever did was uh, trying to maintain itself small in terms of scope, but it was trying to kind of think of a model of a city that instead of thinking of the whole city, you would actually think of just a city block. And what would that city block look like if you could not externalize some of the things that we you know, take for granted, like energy production, waste management, uh, food production, and so on, right? So it, it certainly would put a pressure on densifying that block and, and perhaps hybridizing it in the incorporation of uh, greenery and, and, and different forms of energy production and so forth. So the player is invited to conceive of, of such a, uh, a city block. Um, and in order to do so, we provide around 200 different uh, unique blocks and the blocks range from like different kind of housing units uh, to different form of vegetation, uh, commercial units and all, everything that you can think uh, a city might have. And we were always thinking that this is a library that, that will grow over time, right? And, and we conducted a series of, of workshops to see how uh, architects and non-architects would engage on, on the ideas that this game would, would put forward, right? Some of the main ideas that project was, was trying to argue for is, is subvert the economic model of a, other games like SimCity that you know ask you to manage a city uh, from the perspective of the financing of, of, of the central you know, municipality in a way. And here the cost the uh, the cost of building something was actually reduced to zero. I actually wanted to focus a lot more on the ecological interdependence of units. Right and the upkeep over time, whatever you build needed to maintain, uh, be maintained alive, as opposed to finding the money to build something. Right, and so the way in which it would work is that a unit that would not obtain the right amount of resources over time would slowly deteriorate, decay, and ultimately collapse. Right, so that was the kind of fun part of the game. You are actually building whatever you want, but you would actually be creating the difficulty level of the game. Uh, challenging yourself, maintaining uh, in balance some of your own uh, architectural ambition, right? So your biggest enemy was your own kind of megalomania as an architect, if you want, right? Like when you are, you're starting to build something really large and realize, oh, I don't really have the right resources to keep this uh, uh, working, right? And you would actually see your creations fall apart and break. And, and for many that was kind of heartbreaking, but it was also kind of a, a source of, of learning and fun uh, in the process of designing something, right? Uh, you can find the game also in VR if you're a fan of, of VR. Uh, there's a version of the game in VR as you can see currently on the screen. Um, the game really started, in, these were the early beginnings of the project in a very simple prototype. Uh, sometimes I see students really looking at how to do a game uh, within studio, and I always recommend to really start with the simplest, most bare bones prototype that you might ever think of, right? Um, and this took us maybe two months uh, of development to this this very crude, uh, but but most of the ideas were there. Of how would you actually start thinking of the relationship between blocks and also uh, people? And the as, as I mentioned before, the interdependence of resources between blocks, right? Um, and how you would model different supply chains. This is kind of a, a model of how you would do an organic food production system or an industrial food production system. 
and, and, and those models were all available for the player to explore um, and the game would present consequences, but it wouldn't, it wouldn't guide you. It wouldn't tell you that one was better than the other. You would have to figure that out yourself. So I'm gonna skip a little bit through some of these images. These are some of the kind of computation and, and, and different logics that are within the game, uh, the different kind of data that is presented to a player. Um, I'm a big believer that if you are presenting the right amount of data, in this case to a user, uh, they would actually be able to uh, not only optimize because the game, uh, this is kind of an important point. Many people ask me, uh, can you find like an optimal solution in the game? And I, I'm, I'm certainly against that notion uh, because the, the optimal really depends on the value system of whoever's playing, right? So some people might wanna optimize for height while some other people might wanna optimize for something else, right? And, and I think that these kind of conversations are able to emerge also uh, within digital communities. So as I mentioned, there is no optimal solution in the game. There's only patterns and recipes, right? And here in the book, I, I talk about how someone like Christopher Alexander has used the idea of pattern language to, to determine a series of patterns of architecture that, uh, that seem to work, right? Um, and I, I'm trying to kind of understand patterns in a far more idiosyncratic and contingent way, in a way in which communities might define their uh, value uh, very locally, right? So someone playing in one region of the world might have a very different value system than someone else. Uh, and there could be a conversation, right? Uh, but it doesn't, the game doesn't try to impose a value system. So it, it really argues for an open-ended design system just some images of the of the things that we produced and people have produced with the project again i'm going to skip some of these images and finally um the project common hood which is the, the, the current project that i'm working on i'm just going to leave you uh with the, this is a, a trailer that we kind of cut recently for this project and I, i'm going to use it to explain a little bit uh, how it really became a new chapter on, on the work. Um, so Common Hood tries to move away from, from a game as a diagram and tries to start engaging a bit more explicitly with a, a social narratives, but also a, via a kind of game where, where you would model architecture at a, at a real scale. Right? And I say real scale and then there's this image of a, uh, really large structures that might be unfeasible, but certainly the game uh, allows you to design architecture at a real scale. Um, and it, the game really tries to uh, be a setting for conceiving a, of a DIY architecture, starting to think of the scarcity of resources and how the scarcity of resources can uh, lead you to design a self-sustaining uh, initiatives, right? the game has a very kind of strong sense of starting with very little, right? And how do you kind of create a progression through, um, and there's kind of a lot of different branches and decisions that the player needs to take in order to upgrade a, and, and create certain productive uh, outcomes that might be beneficial for the community. The, the game is really a community simulator. Uh, that's the way most, uh, like the game industry start describe the game. I always thought about it as, a, as, a, as an architecture simulator, but there's a, an important emphasis on, on the management and the kind of the, the sustaining of a community more than the architecture is not the, the end of the game rather, but, but maintaining kind of a, a self-sustained community. So notions of, permaculture, notions of governance, all, all those are included in the game. Um, and, and the game asks this question is that where do we conceive architecture, right? Today, we actually work a lot in, in things like AutoCAD, Rhino, Revit, right? Um, but what would it be like to design architecture from within a different kind of software? One that is already embedded, uh, embeds some of these social narratives, some, some of the ch economic challenges that we see in the world uh, quite explicitly, right? Uh, and that would ask you to kind of design architecture from this point of departure. This is an image of uh, our main character, Nikki. This is the beginning of the game where you, the, the player goes through this eviction and, and becomes a squatter in this abandoned factory, right? So the, 
the game really situates itself through some of the social challenges that, that we see today and, and tries to create an empathy for the player to engage with some of these issues, right? What does it mean to kind of design architecture from within? Uh, this failed project, this abandoned factory, it's a, it's a kind of a post-industrial, describes a post-industrial city, a failed project of progress, right? And we, we've been working on a series of, you know, concepts and, and characters that would kind of inhabit this world as well as, as resources to be crafted and transformed through different forms of technology and, and ultimately different forms of uh, objects that, that makes our life uh, kind of interesting, I guess. And again, when we create this kind of concept art, this is some of the concept art that we've been producing for the game, uh, we try to think what are the possible paths that different players might want to take and what are the different kind of production uh, avenues that they might consider important. Um, so we, we're kind of trying to give options for that. Um, I've always conceived of this project as a, as a design, like how do we conceive of design mediated by scarcity, right? And scarcity is understood as the access to materials, the access of tools, the access to knowledge, and the access to labor. Um, knowledge being the one that at least in this network, producing, providing a a digital platform for the sharing of ideas, uh, it's potentially the one that, that can aid as an infrastructure for, for communication among players, right? And I wanna believe that uh, a design that emerges from, from some of this, uh, from this context is, is, is a little bit more entangled with the narratives of our time. Uh, this is, this is something that uh, I think it has become also important for me. There's also a critique of this project of, of consider the production of games and the role of a player as a, as a god. There's actually a kind of a, a genre of games called the god games. And, and I'm certainly kind of <coughs> trying to develop a critique to this notion. Um, there's also a notion called work, work, uh, worker placement games that is really trying to think of labor as a, as a resource, like human resources, uh, which really becomes this idea of the tycoon game as a genre. And there's many games in this, in this genre. And again, like how do you subvert some of these, these ideas or stereotypes that, that the gaming industry has produced as a type of game um, that operate under the premise of capital accumulation and rather you transform that into a community um, management and, uh, and a production of trust uh, kind of simulation, right? I think there are games such as the case of RimWorld and Prison Architect. And these are games that uh, when you dig beyond the graphical kind of presentation, there's a, a lot of depth to the simulation that they, they offer, right? And I think that there's a lot of lessons to be learned of a kind of simulation that is very open-ended. So I would hope that Common Hood follows uh, that tradition of a series of uh, simulated layers that, that can yield a multiplicity of unexpected results from players. And again, I'm gonna just show you some of the images of, of the project. Um, I can skip on this. This is there's also like a critique on on some of the the model of how do you kind of design the artificial intelligence of a character that you don't play, like a non-playable character. Uh, games like The Sims have been following a particular model, which is the the Maslow hierarchy of needs, and I think that there's also kind of a, a larger project here of, of kind of putting the collective as something that it's a if not more important, but at least equal to kind of self-realization. Um, and how does the player potentially navigate that, uh, those, those hierarchies, right? Um, certainly a very influential book recently, uh, Jenny O'Dell published this book called How to Do Nothing and the idea of resisting the attention economy. Uh, for me, it's really interesting of how do we create a simulation where there is labor, but there's, there, there ought to be also everything that is not labor, right? Like how that, what happens on, on our spare time, what is, but it's a simulation of a community that is not just a productive simulation, right? But perhaps the notion of the unproductive ought to be thought as well. Um, and as, I, as, as Jacob mentioned initially, this, this game, as, as much as you can find a, a version of the game right now, it hasn't been finished. We're releasing the final version of, of the game by the end of this year. So I always invite people to, uh, you know, to kind of follow up on it because it's, what I'm showing you now, it's kind of still premature what the game will become. Um, Finally, the, 
the kind of online commons that we're trying to produce uh, and sustain with players is, is a place where people can actually produce designs, share those designs with each other. Um, and I understand that many of the objectives of these designs will be purposed specifically for the game uh, and might not transfer into the real world. But we are optimistic and that there is a, uh, a certain percentage of the players that might be interested to take some of this in their work into the real world um, in, in our Discord servers, in our kind of community kind of uh, facing channels currently. There's been a conversation about people in Australia that are trying to create a tiny house and we, we're starting to see how people uh, might start using uh, this infrastructure to share with each other what we call blueprints are kind of forms of uh, open source forms of design that they could share with each other, right? And, and we're committed to kind of allow for that and invite people to kind of extract that information as, as their own kind of forms of uh, architectural production. So this is kind of a short final video just to conclude uh, that shows the, like there's, a, there's some mode in the game where you can actually play from within this factory. We're trying to think of what does it mean to kind of produce a kind of a prefabricated design from within this. These, these are very premature designs that we did just by kind of some, some, some kind of the repetition of, of some of these modules. Um, but it shows you the experience of a player if I kind of just skip through uh, of, you can basically save any any number of uh, designs as a blueprint and you can group those blueprints into larger designs and then go and see them uh, and share those online um, and what is interesting that the game doesn't really share like doesn't save the geometry we are moving to a model um, that we're not saving geometry whatsoever when there's no geometry uh, we're saving players actions over time right so a player might click somewhere and create a particular uh, material or a beam or a column in space. And we're saving that action with a timestamp. And then with that information, that kind of log of information, we can uh, recreate the kind of actions and the architecture that they were producing. And that's what we're actually sharing with players. It's a kind of a, it's a tutorial or it's a form of instructable of how to build architecture, right? Um, so looking ahead, um, I, I'm motivated by thinking of design mediated by scarcity. How do we simulate labor, both on the productive sense, but the, also the unproductive? How do we incentivize the, the construction of an online commons, commons understood as communities of individuals that are kind of uh, participating on uh, the sustain and uh, the production of uh, a resource that, that they own? Uh, how do we create architectural knowledge accessible and shareable? How do we track the provenance or origin of ecological dependencies um, of design decisions? Uh, and finally, how do we, and this is kind of in a way the big challenge ahead is how do we kind of start giving fair recognition and potentially remuneration for the production of value, especially when it comes uh, from players, right? Like, so how do you potentially allow players to, uh, if they decide to, a potential profit from their own kind of uh, work. Um, I like finishing with this quote, uh, again, in a little bit in opposition, opposition to some of the ideas of autopoiesis presented by Patrick um, Schumacher. Um, I like the idea of sympoiesis presented by Donna Haraway. Like she argues that sympoiesis is a simple word. It means making with, nothing makes itself. Nothing is really autopoietic or self-organizing. Um, so with that, I'll leave it from there. Thanks so much, Jose. It's amazing, uh, incredible work. Um, I have a number of questions, but I, I, I'd love to, to hear from students. I see that there's quite a few um, from Public Design Corps or anyone else in the audience um, before, I, before I got in. Sorry, I wasn't sure if there was a, oh yeah. Okay, well, I could start because um, I do have a question. So I have a number of questions. I'm not sure exactly how to frame them, but um, I find the trajectory of like your formal 
project really interesting because you're, you're starting with Patrick Schumacher and the kind of like Zaha Hadid legacy with the pink, um, the, like the pink plastic game that like bends on itself, but it's like a, it has a very clear, like, um, I don't know, like formal genealogy, I guess that you can point back to. But as you like move into video games, it's like pretty like squarely, like rectilinear, like the form, yeah. like formal play in the traditional sense becomes less, um, it seemingly less like important as does the understanding of like, like the tree that you're describing. Like if this, then all of these things happen and you need to understand that this thing is a part of a broader network that if you're not paying attention to this, then this breaks down. And so it's, um, I, I'm just curious like wh wh where that comes from. And then yeah. as a, as a, 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 maybe a, I don't know if it's, well, I'm sure they're related somehow, but, um, uh, I don't know, like I was thinking about like with regards to the How to Do Nothing um, book, which is great. Um, I'm also just thinking about like the value of play as like kind of inherently at odds with like capitalist production um, and how you see, I mean, you, you're not, I mean, you did use play, like the word play in part of your presentation, but I'm curious like, what the, what the role and value is of, of play generally. And like children are, you know, like that's part of your audience very clearly. So I'm, I'm curious yeah. about those two things. Yeah, thanks for that. I think that the first one, uh, it's, a, it's a profound <laughs> kind of consideration, uh, which I wanted to kind of include in a, in a, in a chapter in the book, but I, I ended up editing out. Um, the, I, I would argue that the discrete project, uh, which is this notion of modularity that you see in the work that has kind of evolved throughout my work, uh, has kind of understood how particular forms seem to be more conducive for, uh, for coupling or for connectivity, right? And, and I've been thinking about this quite a bit. If you really look around you, like there's certain affordances for a straight line, right? If you have a very kind of a specific and bespoke curve, it limits the kind of a, you know literal connection that that might have with other objects, right? So I think that there is a, a combinatorial uh, affordance of straight lines that is highly uh, it, it allows you know it's a, it's a form of standardization that we have kind of agreed upon or kind of uh, that products might be able to kind of, you know, get closer to a wall and be able to kind of uh, naturally kind of fit with one another, right? So even in, in Bloom, uh, that toy project, you would realize everything is curvilinear except the connection points that are flat because those are the points that we needed to uh, precisely anticipate. And of course, in a jigsaw puzzle, you make connections that are actually curvilinear, but, but the curvilinearity is actually used to define also uh, incompatibility, right? So the whole game of the jigsaw puzzle, it's playing on the idea that you have infinite number of curves all similar to each other, but they don't, they're not quite the same, right? So I think that there is um, an understanding of the affordance of straight lines um, in a project that wants to uh, ultimately create the aggregation uh, of a of objects that might have been created alien to each other or in like not, not being considered by the same users, right? So there's a form of inherent communication or kind of protocol of, uh, of consensus if you want when, when engaging with some of these straight lines. So I think that that, that has opened up a more, more new designs as a form of patterning of, of pieces that might, might be able to couple with each other. So that, that's something that I've been observing and certainly that is what I think you're registering on how that project was maybe more on, on, a, on a kind of aesthetically was kind of more on a tradition of a of parametric form with a certain kind of intricacy and, and kind of a look while, while the work in, in, in later years uh, has become more, in my view, more discreet or has kind of emphasized this kind of condition of coupling. Um, your second question has to do with the idea of play. Um, 
And I think it's it's always interesting that uh, I, I'm I'm presented with this notion of like you know if you uh, like 99% of what people would do in in such a platform would be noise or would be uh, just uh, irrelevant or not interesting, right? Uh, and I think that from as you are arguing, like from a capitalist perspective, you could argue, argue say and say yes, that that's actually correct. Um, but I think that we are underestimating the value of play uh, of you know production or or for engagement that that does not need to fall into that a, a you know design that actually has a, an operative you know value outside the game itself or or outside the person producing it right this idea of of play being you know a form of a personal growth and you know a learning process and so on so I, I celebrate the, the gameplay as a form of production that, uh, or not even a form of production. It's a form of I'm like it, it operates at a different in a different you know uh, category altogether. So I I do talk about play. I do uh, I haven't really kind of profoundly theorized about play, but I think that uh, I, I certainly agree that play has a, has a room in these projects, um, and it doesn't have the expectation to always become. Uh, something that you would be able to fabricate and something that would be kind of a, a design that might might operate and optimize some of our current solutions or any or any of the metrics that you would kind of impose over an object to to argue that it's relevant or not right um, yeah and I, and I think that those are kind of very entangled with the, with the process of education and I, I, I feel very passionate about education obviously I, I teach but I think that uh, embedded into this project is the idea of of engaging audiences that are uh, not already, you know, like uh, thinking that they would be architects, but perhaps, you know, kids that might kind of be interested in in, in this from different angles. So, uh, yeah, I think that the, that 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 game and the playing process uh, offers something that uh, it doesn't try to suggest like a truth, right? It tries to kind of open up options and it, it tries to kind of present alternatives. And I think that what people might do with that, I think that it's always interesting. Uh, we have a question from Rebecca. Um, wondering about the role of conflict and consensus in the work. I think you might be hinting at this in the AI trees toward the end. And there's something quite provocative about incorporating varying degrees of grains of alignment when working in the public realm. This is true, particularly as a counter to reduction of possibilities that often characterize platform or surveillance capitalism as discussed by Zuboff and others. Could you speak more to these themes in the work, social multiplicity, competing agendas, and or how your, your work might amplify slash make visible? Sorry, that was a... Yeah, no, I think that that's right. I think that, you know, I've been I've been reading Suboff. I think that it's it's a central kind of a book, uh, surveillance capitalism, to consider any design of, of, a, of a social media platform. I mean, I, I think of common food as a social media platform that ought to be considering some of the challenges of designing a social media platform. Um, and some of the things are achieved within the platform and some of the things are, 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 are or at least I'm kind of thinking that it will be respond, I might respond to them outside the platform, right? For instance, the open-endedness of the system um, might not only be a way of playing because within the game, you're always kind of perhaps anticipating the moves that a, a user might have, right? In Facebook, you, you only have a handful of actions that you are allowed to do uh, and those are all exhaustively you know calculated to be the ones that kind of maintain you under a particular course so how do you oppose that condition um i don't think you could make a game or a or a, or a piece of technology that is fundamentally open-ended unless uh, you really open the network itself or the software itself right so in gaming there's different ways of doing that the culture of modding i find quite interesting modding it's a modification of the software produced by other developers or players um, to maybe either that sometimes it goes from adding, you know, some textures to a model or to to very advanced things that might create a whole different setting from a game. So I think that really um, the open-endedness of 
the software allows for the project to be taken somewhere else. Um, and again, maybe more internally, like uh, I, I try not to uh, impose a unique metric and, and I kind of try hard to kind of, how do we present, you know, parts and ingredients and perspectives and, and allow communities of players to create kind of uh, different positions and potentially arguments. And, and, and in, in commonhood, uh, there's a lot more of a, of a narrative that takes you into the designing of what are the kind of the governing models for this community, right? Like there's a conversation between you and, and, and the narrative of the game has a lot to do with uh, what is the form of governance, right? Like what is a sustainable form of development that this particular community might have? And you have to decide in a way, how, how do you wanna operate within that? Um, but I think, as I said, I think that that's within kind of a very uh, prepackaged narrative of a game. Uh, I, I would be more interested in uh, kind of a, a larger research that would engage on how does this piece of software infrastructure gets appropriated at a, at a mar more fundamental level for it to be taken somewhere completely um, alien to what it's originally intended by, in this case, myself, the, the development team. Uh, I think there's one more question if, if you have time, Jose. Uh, sure. And then we should, yeah, wrap it up. So, um, Riva says, um, on what models or logic are the community choices and their consequences based in commonhood, e.g. governance, decisions, ecological, permaculture changes, et cetera? How can consequences be determined in this way? And on what time scale are players made aware of the consequences of their choices? Right. Yeah, so that's interesting. I mean, the we're still kind of finalizing some of those issues, so I I, I can only tell you what it's in my mind about uh, both writing some of that narrative and, and kind of implementing some of the um, the way in which you're modeling the potential governing structures for the game. Um, but it's it's try the game tries to start from a, a very kind of naive position of, of a community that might not really be very clear on what they want to do and they might be able to try and change ways of approaching things right um and we really want to offer the player the option of how do you want to distribute income for instance how do you want to go about the allocation of jobs or the allocation of activities right um what happens with with any kind of uh, profits that you produce right um and also there's this each character in the game has been, in a way, designed not as a generic kind of template of an AI, but rather they've been, we've been designing them specifically to be able to kind of, to have different opinions, different, you know, points on perspectives on the world. So yes, this is prescripted and, and it's part of the project to be considered a form of narrative, but it's trying to kind of put the player in a, in a situation where you might have to empathize with some of the, the different perspectives um, that that character will have, right? And you might not be able to please everybody. I think that some of the challenges, like how do you navigate between characters that have fundamentally different perspectives of the world? The challenges and the, the kind of the consequences of your actions, I think in Blockhood, that those were a bit more explicit uh, in terms of uh, how if you would produce a, let's say, if you would like have an incinerator and start producing like burning waste in, in a certain way, there would be kind of a, like a certain very explicit ecologic impact to that. Um, but in commonhood, I don't want to I don't want to spoil the story, but there's a series of very critical kind of events that uh, become branching uh, options in the game, and then they really kind of change the state of the world depending on. Uh, what you decide, right? Which technologies you decide to use, uh, what kind of development you decide to take part of. Um, yeah, and I think that we want to make that uh, hit some kind of emotional and kind of notes when, when engaging some of those decisions, right? So hopefully you'll be able to play the game a couple of times and see that the game changes if, if you take some certain decisions in different ways. But but it's all for the purpose of, of kind of giving a sense of meaning and purpose to what you're doing, right? Um, and yeah, so I, I don't know if that answers it. Like, I don't I don't want to spoil some of the, 
some of the the issues that you will potentially be able to to go through the game when you play. That was great. Thanks so much. Awesome. Well, thanks everybody uh, for staying a few minutes late, and thank you, uh, especially Jose, for again your time and the amazing work. It's such a pleasure. Um, to, to see it and talk about it. Um, there's so many more questions I have, but you know, for now, I'll call it a Thank day. Thank you. It's um, always, I'm always happy to, to discuss the ideas and I'm sure we're gonna have other opportunities to do it more informally. Great, awesome. Thanks everybody. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks Jose. Thanks Jacob. <laughs>